Okay, we're back. Uh, trying to. <coughs> oh man. <laughs> okay. Guess I wasn't back. Anyway, I'm back now. Choking on my own bile. <laughs> Yay. Uh, we're back. I'm here reacting to um, this debate. Does physicalism or idealism best explain reality? Dr. Graham Oppie and Dr. Bernardo Castro. This is uh, premiered two years ago over on the Digital Gnosis channel. Look, I even learned how to use OBS a little bit. See, watch this. We're well, going to watch this now. Oh, I'm going to be over here. And they're going to be over there. Uh, ooh, and then I'm back. Hey, it's like I learned how to use OBS or something. Hey, <laughs> hell dog new tricks. All right. <laughs> no one should ever put me in front of a camera. I think that's established. Okay, anyway, so I've been trying to, you know, I see all these comments coming in. I, I've been really enjoying the discussion on these other videos that I've been making. Um, it's hard to get to respond to, especially over the weekend when I have family duties and stuff and, you know, Nicki Minaj and Megan Thee Stallion are going back and forth at each other. How am I supposed to focus? Nicki puts out Bigfoot and I'm supposed to be talking about philosophy? I mean, are we serious? <laughs> we got Megan's Law to talk about? Um, Megan Thee Stallion? Rap beef. Okay, so anyway, it's hard to focus on all this stuff. Um, uh, but seriously... Um, reading the comments, I've, I've been encouraged that there's lots of discussion, interesting things that people are saying. It's hard to keep up with them, though, uh, especially typing um, because I have so many other things going on. But now that we're here and it's um, the weekday, then maybe we'll get to some of those comments. I do want to address some of them. Um, come back later today. I'll be having my live stream with Eric Switch Cable talking about his book, Weirdness of the World. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I don't know exactly when this will be up, but I assume it will be before 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, then later this week, I'm going to have another open call in office hours. Uh, so you can come and talk to me or argue with me or insult me. <laughs> Whatever your little heart desires, it's live. So I can't do much about it. But uh, feel free to come by, ask questions or ask me to defend a position um, that uh, you don't like. I'm more than happy to do that. So I thinking that that's going to be uh, Wednesday. Uh, my classes are started. I have this consciousness and neuroscience class at the Graduate Center with Tony Rowe. That's starting up tomorrow, I think, actually. Um, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to do this live thing on Wednesday, possibly. Uh, and then next Monday, of course, um, I have Steve Fleming. We'll be talking about uh, his book, Know Thyself, The Science of Metacognition. Um, and then more exciting things coming up after that. Matthias Michelle and, and Ned Block to be scheduled. So that's coming up on Consciousness Live in my Richard Brown Reacts series. I'm doing this and then I wanted to check out that Kevin Mitchell, Robert Sapolsky debate and then let me know what else I should be checking out. Um, I'm aiming for kind of shorter videos, 15 minutes or so. It seems like people are enjoying that more. But if you would like the longer ones, let me know. So I'm pretty much just here doing what you guys are interested in me doing, hopefully, or not. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, let's test this out. I think this is pretty much right where I left it. So last time where we were in this debate was we had um, an opening discussion between Bernardo and uh, Graham about naturalism and what views count as naturalism. I think this was started because Graham Oppie was saying he thinks of his view as naturalism, not physicalism, even though he thinks all there is is the physical stuff. And uh, Bernardo was saying, that's unfair to me because I think of myself as a naturalist too. And I was saying, there's really not much at stake over that, um, over that label because they do clearly disagree about whether the fundamental nature of reality is mental or not. So whatever you call it, uh, that's where the disagreement lies. Um, and then... Uh, we were just about to get to Oppie's response <clears throat> to some things that uh, Bernardo was saying. So let's go ahead and jump right back into this. I believe <clears throat> I have already, uh, this is where we left off, but I don't know. So we'll check it out. Might have backed up a little bit. Also, by the way, this is coming from the Digital Gnosis channel, as I said already. Um, so uh, he's asking for people to support him there. Go ahead. I, you know, I don't have any way of supporting me, so you may as well support someone. <laughs> Uh, and we are getting this from his channel. Okay, so let's jump right back into this. Um, so 
And there are a few things in that characterization that I disagree with. Uh, so one thing that I would dispute is the, uh, but maybe again, this will turn out to be terminological, is that um, consciousness or um, the mental more broadly is emergent. So I'm an identity theorist. I think that conscious states and mental states more generally just are certain kinds of I mean, states or processes. Just Yeah, okay, so this is a good point. Um, in Bernardo's characterization of physicalism, <clears throat> he was saying in our last video that we were looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, Bernardo was saying that uh, physicalists think that consciousness emerges from the physical stuff. So if you're an, and if you're an identity theorist, then this is not the way to think of things. Um, there's no emerging. It's just that consciousness is identical with something physical. Uh, this is something that has, you know, <clears throat> bothered me a lot. So when you talk about reduction, there's two kinds of reduction people generally talk about, what they call theoretical reduction, where you take one theory and try to reduce it to another theory, um, needing some bridge laws that, that link between the two vocabularies of the theory, allowing you to deduce um, one set of things from the other set of things. Uh, so that's theoretical reduction. Then sometimes people talk about ontological reduction, where it's not something about theories or sentences or definitions, but it's something about um, the thing itself and what its fundamental nature is and whether it's uh, really ultimately nothing but these other things. Like, for example, when people say water is reduced to H2O, what they mean is that water is nothing but H2O. That's all there is to water is H2O. Now, it's not technically reduction in the, in the other sense, because you're not really reducing anything. If there's just one thing there, you're not reducing one to the other. It can't be that there were two things and then one gets <laughs> reduced because according to the identity theorists, there's just one thing. Um, this is, so people have a tendency to tr say things are identical, but then treat them as distinct. This is something that I have in my past work called an ep identity, an epiphenomenal identity. Um, and I think we do have clear cases of this. So the clearest case I think comes from music um, so if you think about the, uh, C major scale, the notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, okay, yay. So then you might, um, ask your music teacher or musician friend. So C major scales, huh? Interesting. I wonder if there's E sharp in that scale and your friend will probably say, no, 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 no. There's no E sharp in the C major scale. It's F, don't you know? Uh, C, D, E, F. And you say, yeah, but isn't F? Um, a half step above E, and therefore, isn't it E sharp? And they will respond, yeah, technically, it's the same sound, but the notes are not the same because uh, F is in the C major scale, but F sharp is in the C sharp major scale. And of course, we have a reason for that. It's useful to treat them this way because we have a whole theory about the circle of fifths, and we want them to be adding a sharp every time we go up, and the only way that will make sense is if C sharp has... Um, the E sharp note, and if the C major doesn't, because then we can say C major has no flats or sharps, even though, you know, you would say, gee, isn't C itself B sharp? <laughs> and can't all of these be thought of as sharps or flats? Well, okay, so that's uh, an ep identity. It's clearly that they're the same note sound. Uh, that's what musicians call enharmonically identical. So they have the same sound, a C sharp, excuse me, F sharp and what am I saying? E sharp and F have the same sound. They make the same sound wave vibrations when you hit that key. Um, but it's useful for us to treat them as distinct because then we can organize things according to the circle of fifths and we can uh, say things like um, E sharp is in that scale and not in this other scale, even though the same sound is in both of those scales, the same you know vibration, frequency, wavelength, physical thing is the same there. So the point is that there's many, this is just one example because I'm familiar with music somewhat, I mean, quote, <laughs> familiar with music. <laughs> um, I have been learning how to play the piano since my son started taking lessons and challenged me um, that he was better than me. I had to learn how to play piano. <laughs> but I wouldn't say I'm a piano player uh, or that I'm any good. Anyway, so I do know some of this stuff and it is anno it is fun to annoy your music, your son's music teacher by asking him whether... <laughs> E sharp is in the C major scale, um, or whether uh, F is in the C sharp major scale. 
Okay, so anyway, the point though is that there are, this is just one example. There are other examples where the, we recognize that the things are identical, um, but it's useful to treat them as distinct. So Superman Clark Kent is another famous example. So even in, though in the movie, um, it makes sense to say Superman is, is Clark Kent. Uh, I don't know any traditional newer movies, like who is Aquaman? Does he have a secret identity? I have no idea. Aquaman, secret identity. There's Peter Parker, maybe from Spider-Man. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. The point though is that um, it's useful to treat them as distinct because then we can say Superman works at the Daily Planet, but excuse me, Clark Kent works at the Daily Planet and Superman doesn't. But of course, really the same guy works at the Daily Planet and it's Superman and Clark Kent, they're the same guy. Superman wears glasses, Clark Kent flies. Um, it's just that Clark Kent flies usually when he's dressed as Superman. Not always, if you watch the movies, I guess, or the comics or whatever, but mostly. And then um, alternatively, uh, he, he wears glasses when he's at the Daily Planet. But of course, Superman wears glasses when he's dressed as Clark Kent. So they're the same guy, even though it's useful to treat them as distinct. Uh, those two notes are the same note, even though it's useful to treat them as distinct. And I, have a th I think that people have a tendency when they think about the identity theory of mind and brain to do this as well. That there's really two things there. And we're somehow, you know, trying to glue them together and say, look, they're the same thing. But we're not really gluing two things together, the identity theorists anyway. Um, what they're doing is uh, identifying, saying it's the same thing that's there. It's not something that emerges from the brain. Um, it's something that uh, it just is a particular brain state. So that's the identity theory that he's talking about here. All right, enough of me ranting. Let's hear what else he's going to say. There are certain kinds of neural states or processes, and states or processes states more generally just are certain kinds of, I mean, states or processes just are certain kinds of neural states or processes, and that's not appropriately called an emergentist view, right? Identity theory is something different. That's uh, fair enough. Uh, All right, so Bernardo says that's fair enough there. Um, so I guess he's taking the point, but you know, um, even though the physicalist theory of consciousness is not emergentist, the physicalist does like invoke emergent phenomenon. I mean, the liquidity of water is supposed to be an emergent phenomenon, a weekly emergent, something that, you know, Maybe you could or could not deduce from the, the base facts. I'm not sure what Graham's position. I guess I do know Graham's position. He probably thinks you can't do this, given what he said in the intro, that his view, he wants to be naturalist but not physicalist, and he identi identifies physicalism with this <coughs> a priori deduction stuff, maybe. I think that's what he said in the last time, actually, or hinted at. Um, but there still is a sense in which the world emerges from the base of physics, cats, tables, chairs, these are all emergent phenomena in some sense. Um, so maybe that maybe that's not the problematic sense that Bernardo was trying to pin on the physicalist, but uh, while their theory of consciousness is not emergent, emergentist, I think that they, the physicalist is generally committed to emergentism of some sort. Okay, so it's not an emergence. I like that. It's not ontological reduction. It's identification. So yeah. that's one thing. Um, the second thing, uh, I distinguished between the kind of physicalist view and the naturalist view in terms of the vocabulary that you need to describe what's fundamental. And um, what I think is fundamental in, in your theory is everything that doesn't get um, explicitly defined in other terms. Now, I don't think, for example, that you can give a definition of, say, cat in the vocabulary of fundamental physics. I think this okay. is a matter of principle. Yeah. So uh, the idea that, um, that you can do that strikes me as an extreme view, but that's a view that often gets called physicalism. And yeah, exactly. So define defining cat in terms of fundamental physics sounds a bit bizarre. This is one of the areas where I think I agree with like the critique from David Chalmers of this sort of stuff. Um, I think this business about definition is really 
uh, red herring. So can you define cats in terms of fundamental physics? Um, probably not. <laughs> you don't have the right concepts to use. There's not, you don't have the concepts of animal and furry. You have concepts of mass and charge. Uh, so they're just not going to be definitionally equivalent. Um, but, uh, you know, so does that mean that you can't know on the basis of fundamental physics, whether there are cats or not in a given physical description, whether or not this is a description of a cat? Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the business about definitions misleads us. We, it's, it's about knowledge. Can you start from the physics and know something about the way the world is going to be? Now, I'm sympathetic to the answer being no on certain days. On other days, I'm sympathetic to the answer being yes. And I have to say my intuitions um, say yes. <laughs> so the days when I'm not sympathetic to that are the days when I'm wondering whether I should, how, how serious I should take my intuitive assessments of these cases, given that uh, my intuitive assessments are often wrong. So, but I do feel the intuition that, yeah, if you had like a completed physics, then you would know whether there's cats in a given physical description. Um, I, I think the argument from Chalmers about the Cosmoscope actually helps us here. So Chalmers imagines this thing called the Cosmoscope, which is like a, a simulation room, you know, like a holodeck from Star Wars. Star Wars? Star Trek. I just made the... <laughs> I just made the most noob beginner mistake of all time. Star Wars, Star Trek. Oh my God, I should punch myself. Whap! All right. <laughs> Um, no more teching. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Oh, holodeck. Right, so the Cosmoscope is this idea. It's kind of like a holodeck from Star Trek. Not Star Trek, by the way. At least I can say Trek. Um, and uh, you imagine sort of feeding in the completed physics, whatever you think the most compact set of facts is. For me, I think of it as like, Physics plus information that answers questions about indexicals. Um, what Chalmers calls PTQI, but without the Q. <laughs> so P is the completed physical theory. T is some kind of completeness theorem that says that's it. Um, Q is like the consciousness stuff. Chalmers thinks you need to add that. I would say maybe you don't. And then I is the indexical stuff. So PTI, um, you put that into the computer and then you ask the computer to simulate the answer to any question that you're interested in. So if you want to know if there are, so, you know, are there cats in this world or not? You could ask the computer, it has this fundamental physical description. Um, and then it would tell you, okay, so go to earth and show me what this does and implement the math. And you would see whether there are cats or not. You could ask you about their physical composition and all that stuff. So, or at least I find that plausible. Lots of people don't. But I, I, do, I do find that plausible, I think, in which case I would say this business about definitions isn't really, it's really old school. Like this is the way um, people like in the beginning of the identity theory, this is what they were talking about. Um, and I think we have moved past that a little bit. So I don't like this idea that you can't define a cat in terms of physics. I think that's sort of obvious, but not but besides the point. Anyway, let me be quiet. How do you get them to talk? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the reason why I wanted to, I don't know why I want to call my view naturalism is to distinguish it from that kind of view. Now, I agree that um, the, word, the word natural is a very interesting word. It has many, many different kinds of meanings, mostly um, when you think about the contrast between the natural and the unnatural or the non-natural. Natural turns out to be positive. And so I'm quite happy to accept that there's a sense in which um, people quite generally want to be able to call themselves naturalists because, of, after all, the alternative being sort of an unnaturalist or a non naturalist or something like that doesn't. Stop. Yeah, I, did I watch this part in the first video? I might be repeating some of this, but it doesn't matter. Um, I have seen this whole video before, before I, by the way, I'm not really seeing this for the first time. I saw this when it first came out back in 2020. Maybe I saw this in 2022, since I'm not really up on my December 13th stuff. But uh, December 13th, I wonder if last year, was it Friday the 13th on December the 13th? Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> 
Let's go to the calendar. I must know um, for no particular reason. No, the 13th was a Monday. I don't know. Wouldn't Monday the 13th be technically worse than Friday the 13th, don't you think? Monday the 13th? Mondays, dude. Okay. Anyway, so let's continue with this. I already said my spiel about definitions, so we don't need to go back over it. Uh, it would perhaps be better to have some neutral vocabulary here. but in Right, the- but so this is what he was saying last time, or which I was anticipating him saying, or which I remember from last time. I don't remember. It's all blur last time, but yeah, so he's calling his view naturalism because he doesn't want to be committed to this idea that you can define a cat in terms of physics. I wouldn't say that's what physicalism is. Physicalists think... Um, that things are physical and then you have to say well what does that mean and one way to define that is to say yeah okay um uh there's this a priori entailment between the physical facts and consciousness another way to go is to deny that and just say <laughs> things are physical <laughs> and um then you have to say what that means i've always been partial to the so-called negative way the we via negativa which says you know what we mean by physical is that it's not mental so the fundamental stuff is not mental um that's usually enough for me whatever you want to call the view that the fundamental stuff is not mental that's probably the view that's uh bernardo would argue against so whatever you call it that would be fun circles where i'm having discussions um most of the time that is with theists the contrast between theism and naturalism doesn't evoke the same kind of controversy that the contrast between naturalism and idealism, supposing that we're using the terms that way, does. So um, yeah. I guess we're kind of stuck with, we come from different places where um, the label naturalism kind of serves kind of different roles. Yeah, so, okay, so he's not trying to bias the question or piss Bernardo off. He's just saying, when I argue with theists, they know naturalism is the view that there's no God, um, that the world is explainable in terms of laws and so forth, uh, without appeal to a supernatural being. I wouldn't call it unnatural, just supernatural, above, the, above nature, outside of nature, um, where nature is a kind of law-governed bubble or something like that. So uh, that's the contrast in the theist debates. And, that, and by those lights, Bernardo is a naturalist. I don't know what his views about religion are. I guess he thinks there's more than, there's something to the religious stuff, given the things I've heard him say and his views on idealism. But it's not exactly what the traditional theists have thought, as far as I know. So, <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. Can I ask a question? Not a rhetoric question. It's an it's a honest, uh, sincere question. Uh, okay. um, Professor Op, you said... Um, you're an identity theorist, so for you it's not like qualia or experience somehow emerges out of physical arrangements, it's that experience is physical arrangements. At the same time you said we can't reduce a cat to physical properties alone. Uh-huh. These two things seem sound contradictory to me, how, how do you reconcile these two statements? So, I don't... Well, hold on, so first of all, we already, we were just talking about that, so... You can't reduce a cat in terms of giving a definition of a cat in terms of physics. But nonetheless, all there is to the cat is the physical stuff. Um, I see someone in the chat is asking if pineapple on pizza is part of the unnatural world. I'm from California. We like pineapple on pizza, guys. I'm sorry. It's delicious. It's quite natural. It's very good. <laughs> um, now that I'm looking at the chat, it says, is Castro a theist? Someone's asking. So I think the answer is no, but I'm not sure. And someone else is saying, perhaps I'm wrong, but idealism and identity theory seem to take a similar approach in regards to the relation of brain and mind, just have a different ontological primitive. Uh, I guess there's a sense in which that's true since they think the mind is identical to consciousness but they also think that consciousness is outside the mind and the identity theorist doesn't so it's not that they just have an ontological primitive it's that they think that consciousness is more widespread or something like that um but yeah the identity uh you know if water is h2o then h2o is water einhorn is finkel and finkel is einhorn (laughs) you know if a is b b is a 
So that's the way identities work, absolutely. So if, a, if pain is a brain state, then a brain state is pain. Um, that's what they are. But according to the idealist, um, there isn't really even a brain state, just an appearance of a brain state. There's just consciousness. Um, so I don't think they're really the same. Anyway, I should stop paying attention to the chat. I want to hear what these guys are saying. I actually don't see what the what the problem is, right? Exactly. So um, for something to be having experiences, so we'll think of experiences as kind of processes, um, say, say it's a human being, for them to be having experiences is just for them to be d doing certain kinds of neural processing embedded in a physical environment. Oh, digital gnosis says Bernardo's not a theist. Okay, so yeah, so uh, that's why he wants to be natural. That's so if you calling every view that is a not theistic naturalism, then Bernardo's a naturalist. Uh, you know, someone said it seems like I said I don't care, but then I do care about naturalism. I don't know if I care about it or not. Uh, what I care about is whether one thinks that there are good reasons for denying that consciousness is physical. And I don't. <laughs> but I think that if you do, then, um, you know, I, I can understand why you might. But uh, I think it's interesting to explore the options. But I never really got past this first point of why we should give up the identity theory. Not that I officially endorse the identity theory. I just think that there's no good arguments against it. Um, and that it should be thought of as one of the very bizarre counterintuitive views, which is on the table. So I'll be talking to Eric about the weirdness of the world. And, you know, this is one of the weird things that could be true, I think. In the right kind of way. Likewise for cats their experiences will be for them to have the kind of cat neural processes going on in the physical environment in the right kind of way. Maybe there's some other sort of stuff that you have to talk about evolutionary history and so on, but that's, but that's just what having experiences is. Uh, there's no um, idea that you can, uh, with, with, with this, identification it's a theoretical identification it's not eliminating either half right, right. so it's not saying really there's just um, neural states and there's no mental states and it's not on the other hand saying really there's just mental states and there's no neural states it's saying the two things are one that's that's what the identity theory is well saying. yeah you're not saying two things are one you're saying there's only one thing <laughs> there's not two things <laughs> two ways of Knowing about the same thing are knowing about the same thing is really what you're saying. So you're making the epistemic point that you're knowing about this thing in different ways. Concluded to the metaphysical point that there's just one thing there. Um, yeah. So, but what was he saying? Because there's something fishy about the way he's saying this. Hold on. Um, Radical identification. It's not the oh, right. idea that you can, uh, with, with with this identification, it's a theoretical identification. Uh, that's what he said. Okay, so he's saying it's a theoretical identification, which puts him in the camp of the the Ned blocks of the world. Um, I think so. There's really two approaches to identity, at least two to identity statements. So one is that you deduce it. So you have some functional description. Water is the clear odorless liquid, falls from the sky. And then you have, that's your first premise, sort of give a functional definition of what water is. And the second premise says, the stuff that falls from the sky fills the lakes around here is H2O. And the conclusion of that is water is H2O. So that's the kind of view that Chalmers and maybe Bernardo has in, in mind as well, that there's a kind of a priori path from some functional description to an identification of what plays that functional role. And then the idea is that, well, consciousness is hard to do that with. But the alternative view is not to say that you deduce the identity, but rather that it's a, it's a posit in order to explain something else. So, you know, we start with this correlation. Water is correlated with H2O. Every time we see water, we also find H2O. So there's this correlation uh, between the two. So you could say that they, uh, they're not the same thing, that there's water, which is uh, some other thing, which is correlated with H2O. 
But then you wouldn't be able to explain why water freezes at a certain temperature, why it boils at another temperature, why it's a, a, a liquid at room temperature or a, of the properties of water. I mean, we can't explain all the properties of water as far as I know. Like we don't know why water floats as a, when it's a, um, a, a solid. Every other liquid that freezes is more dense than its liquid state. So it sinks, water isn't that way. So that's very interesting. However, and I don't think we have an explanation of that in terms of fundamental physics. Although you sort of see how maybe possibly you could give one if this other stuff works out. Okay, great, so wonderful. Um, it's a theoretical identity. It's postulated to explain something else. If you think that water and H2O are identical, then you can explain why water freezes at a certain temperature because of the properties of H2O. You, you don't have to say H2O does this lattice structured thing and then that's correlated with this solid state of water. You say the solid state of water is this lattice structure in the H2O. You get an explanation. And in the mind-brain case, similarly, the idea is supposed to be that uh, we find the correlation between mind and brain and, and then we identify them to get an explanation. So why do I pull my hand away from the fire, nurse it, go like this, start hopping around, dang, ah, dang, dang, but, and all that stuff? Um, well, because pain. So there's a brain state and then there's my pain. They're correlated. If you identify the two, then you can explain why I'm acting the way I'm acting. You get a straightforward account. I'm acting this way because of the pain, um, not because the brain state is correlated with the pain. You don't have to explain that. So the identities are postulated to explain something else. That seems to be the view that, um, that, uh, that Oppie has here. Um, which puts it in contradistinction to the view I think that Bernardo has. So they really have different views about what physicalism is, as far as I can tell. Um, I don't think they really address this in their discussion with each other. But let's see. Not eliminating either half, right? So it's not saying really there's just um, neural states and there's no mental states. And it's not, on the other hand, saying really there's just mental states and there's no neural states. It's saying the two things are one. That's that's what the identity theory says. This is the view that um, Jack Smart um, introduced in his 1963 paper, um, whatever it was called, uh, <laughs> identity and brain processes or whatever it was called. I think it's sensations and, I, and brains processes, but yes, good. I think that Smart um, was just right. If it... Okay, so interesting. Yeah, there's a lot about the identity theory there. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to keep these a little bit shorter. As I said, I think it's more watchable if they're 15 or 20 minutes. Although I could be wrong. So if you guys prefer a longer format, let me know because like I said, I'm open. But I, I think this is a good stopping point. So let's stop here. We'll come right back. Um, this will let me fill up my coffee. Uh, no tea yet. I'm still on the coffee train. <laughs>